All right, hello and welcome to a new week. This week is all about number theory and encryption. So, uh, a lot of fun stuff. Let us begin. A lot of topics that I'm required to teach you about this stuff too. It's very fun. Uh, hopefully you will enjoy it as much as I do. Here's a fun uh, image that kind of has to do with what we're gonna get into. So enjoy the XKCD and let us begin. So let's talk about division again, because numbers, number theory, right? Division is a number thing to do. So let's uh, discuss. So let's go back to that divides notation and definition again. So let's uh, rehash this. So X divides Y, we say that, we write it like this with a slash, X divides Y, if and only if, so you can go either way, it's a biconditional, if X is not equal to zero and there is an integer K such that Y equals K times X. So X divides Y when you can multiply something by X and get Y, right? So X is uh, a factor or a divisor we say of y and then y we say is a multiple of x because maybe k was like 2 maybe k was 3 y is a multiple of x okay and x is a factor of y so those, those are the terms that I'm sure you remember uh, one that you may have not heard of if you haven't taken like linear algebra yet a linear combination of two numbers is uh, when you add together multiples of those numbers so for example 2x minus 42y is a linear combination of 42 of uh, x and y because like you can pick 2 and negative 42 those are the coefficients those are the multiples of x and y same with like I don't know negative 43x plus 27y that's another linear combination okay so with that let us have our first real number theory proof so let's pretend we have x y and z those are integers this is a uh, implicitly a for all proof because we are saying nothing special about x, y, and z. They could be anything. Uh, so if x divides y and x divides z, then x divides sy plus tz for any integers s and t. Isn't that nice? So this is a uh, x divides any linear combination. That's uh, that's what we're trying to say here, right? X divides any linear combination of uh, y and z. Okay? Does that make sense? So we assume that we have these numbers and we assume this, right? It's a direct proof. So if this is true, then, so assume this, prove this. Gotcha? Let's do it. So uh, all we have to do is use the definitions and it will unravel to be a true statement. So if, because we're assuming x divides y and x divides z, let's unpack that using these definitions, right? So if we know x divides y, from that we get that y equals k times x for some integer, right? Same with x divides z. We know, based on that assumption, we're assuming it, that z equals, not k again, but let's say m, m times x. And these are both true for some ints k and n, okay? For ints k and m. So we have this. We can unpack the definitions. We're assuming this is true. Then we need to show still, right, that x divides sy plus tz, which is equivalent to this. So NTS for need to show. If we can just show this, we would prove the theorem. We need to show that sy plus tz equals, like let's say r times x for some r, okay? And for any t and s. For any s and t, okay? X divides any any linear combination of x and or sorry y and z. Once we know these two things, okay. So let's see if we can make that happen. So we need this for any s and t. So they better be left arbitrary. So this is how you continue the proof to prove this for all for any s and t. We first. Well, let's introduce s and t. Let s and t be arbitrary integers. Arbitrary ints. Okay, so now I've introduced them. They're anything. And if I can prove the theorem for this with those arbitrary values, then I've shown it for any s and t. Okay, so now let's unpack our definitions. S, y plus t, z. That's equal to, well, I know what y and z are based on these assumptions. 
Let's see if that helps us at all. So that's s times kx plus t times mx, because that's what z is. Interesting, interesting. I can bring an x out of both of these. So that's the same as equals x times sk plus tm. Interesting. Uh, and what do you know? I can bring that on the other side. This is sk plus tm times x. And what do you know? I found an integer when multiplied by x equals sy plus tz. See, just let r, let r be this. And suddenly I have shown what I needed to show, okay? So I found a, a multiple, it's this multiple of x that makes sy pl plus tz, okay? And so that works for any s and t. So based on that, therefore, I have shown that x divides sy plus tz, where those were arbitrary, so it works for all of them. And so I've got my proof, our first interesting number theoretical proof. So if x divides y and x divides z as well, then x divides any linear combination of y and z. That's a very powerful statement, isn't it? So that's the proof. Nice, huh? So, okay, I have an easier one for you to try yourself this time. Tell me, is it true that 7 divides 21? Tell me, and explain your answer using the definition of divides, okay? So think about that. And so, just in English, 7, of course it divides 21. Yes, the answer is yes, but why? All right, and that's the devil's in the details. The reason why is you can find, well, it's not, it's not zero, and you can find a number such that uh, seven times that number equals 21, right? And that's your K. Because yeah, 21 is equal to three times seven. And that's the K we could pick and use in the definition, okay? And it's an integer as well. Three is an int, right? That's also necessary. So it's seven divides 21, yes, because of this, because 21 equals three times seven, it's an integer multiple of it, okay? Another example for you. So try this proof, okay? Try to prove that for every integer, a, b, and c, if a divides b and a divides c, then a squared divides b times c. Interesting, huh? So you can kind of like multiply these rules together and somehow end up with this. See if you can figure out how to do that. And it's gonna be very similar to this proof, okay? Unravel those definitions. And once they come together, you'll end up with an answer, okay? So try this one, oh, sorry, this one. All right, so uh, normally we start our proofs with proof rate. I should have said that last time, but let us continue. So for all integers a, b, and c, so let's make them arbitrary. That's how we prove a for all. So let a, b, and c be ints. And then we're also proving an if then, right? An implication. So it's if this is true, then this is true. So that's a direct proof usually. Let's do it as a direct proof. Let's assume these and prove that. So let a, b, and c be ints and assume that a divides b and a divides c. Okay, now we'll show this and that's what we need to do. Okay, so uh, let's unravel these definitions first because those are usually helpful. So a divides b, that means b is equal to some integer multiple times a, so b equals ka, and same for c, a divides c, so c is equal to j times a, let's say, uh, for some integers k and j. So now that I have that, uh, let's see what we need to prove still, right? We need to show that a squared equals b times c. Uh, need to show, or sorry, a squared divides b times c. So that's the same as uh, bc is equal to some integer multiple. Let's call it r again, times a squared, okay? So if we showed that, then we have our proof. So let's see if this helps us. Let's, I can multiply b and I can multiply c. I can multiply both sides of these equations by each other because they're equal. So that gives me bc, and if I multiply this by this, right, because that's b times c all over again, that's equal to 
ka times ja and what do you know that is kj times a squared ooh ooh ooh, ooh. and that's an integer because it's a multiple of integers that could be my r i found an r for which this works for which this equation holds and therefore i have proven that a squared divides b times c isn't that nice yay mic drop do you ask me questions about this these are the kinds of proofs that you got to get used to doing okay so this is a for all proof so we assumed these and proved that using direct proof okay just unraveling the definitions and doing a little bit of math gave us what we needed to show and that proves our final statement isn't that nice so uh that's some initial integer stuff let's talk about uh division some more we talked about divides let's talk about division as just a i guess an operation so here is another theorem that we will prove maybe later uh it's kind of difficult but we'll get there let's talk about this thing called the division algorithm so this is what it means to divide a number so let's let n be an integer and let d be a positive integer okay once we have those it is a theorem it is always true that there are unique integers q and r stands for quotient and remainder where r is between 0 and d minus 1 right r can't uh, the remainder can't be uh, any bigger than what you're dividing by otherwise it would go in one more time such that n equals q d plus r okay so uh, q is the quotient and r is the remainder that's the idea and so what we're trying to do here is we're trying to divide n by d okay we're trying to prove that there's always a unique answer when you divide n by d that gives you a quotient with a remainder r okay that's what this theorem is saying uh, and once i spell it out to you like that yeah it's obvious we know how division works but it's actually kind of hard to prove okay and uh, out of this we can get interesting things okay so in the division algorithm we say that q is the quotient and r is the remainder like i said and then uh, we can pick out individual bit uh, individual pieces of those we can pick out the q and pick out the r with a div operation and a mod operation okay so that'll give you the quotient and the remainder so q we define q to be based on this theorem q is n div d and uh, so div is doing integer division okay it's dropping that remainder so if you see the div operation anywhere else in your book or later in the slides it's integer division so dropping the remainder no decimals or anything remainder okay and then we have n mod d where mod is exactly the same as the c plus plus modulus operation that gives you the remainder after dividing n by d okay so now I have those operations that I can perform in an algorithm, maybe. So here are some examples, just so that you know the notation. So uh, let's do, it's supposed to be an E, 7 div 3, right? So a 7 integer divided by 3, that would give us back 3, 6, so it goes in twice, right? And then 7 mod 3 is the remainder, right? That's one. There's one left over after dividing seven by three. Goes in twice, that makes six. One more makes seven. That's the remainder. And the remainder is always smaller, strictly smaller than the number you're dividing by. That's where this comes into play. Otherwise, three would have gone in one more time. If the remainder were three, that's impossible. Okay? And the reason this all works is because of the division algorithm. Okay? So we say that uh, this is all working because seven is equal to two times three of the quotient, right? quotient times the divisor right plus the remainder plus one so that's where they all come into play okay that is the secret that is how it's working so let me uh, maybe highlight those and then we can move on so there's your uh, quotient there's your remainder q r and that was the d that we were dividing by right there and of course, this all works out because that's six plus one equals seven. Okay, checks out, 
division is a thing. All right, so that's the division algorithm. It will come up later, especially these operations. And maybe we'll prove it if we're lucky. Okay, now let's talk about modular arithmetic. So, you know the mod operation. That's the percent sign. There's more to it than that. There's a whole branch of arithmetic based on taking mods of numbers, taking the modulus. Weird enough. So uh, it turns out that having numbers that wrap around on each other is a good thing for a lot of uh, ideas that you want to express. So one very important concept that modular arithmetic is uh, a key factor in is time, right? So if you have a clock, you go around, you add one hour to 12, and you end up at one o'clock again, right? So a number that was big got small. That's essentially modular arithmetic, right? So it's like you're counting up. You're always, okay, zero mod five equals, uh, that's zero, one mod five, that's one, on and on and on, until four mod five, that's four, and then the second you get to five, you start wrapping around. Five mod five, assuming you're doing mod five. That goes to zero, and then six mod five is now one again. So it's very similar to a clock, right? That's modular arithmetic. What you do is you pick a number m, and you always remember after you do your normal, uh, sorry, I forgot a mod five there. There's supposed to be a five. You pick a number m that you're modulusing by, and that I didn't mean to make you larger, just wanted to move you. Easier said than done. There we go. So you pick a number, and then you always, after you do whatever operation, you always do mod m. So you just always stay between 0 and 4, for example, if you're working mod 5. Okay? That's what you do. And so the numbers that you get out after doing arithmetic and then mod m are always between 0, 1, and m minus 1, right? That's the biggest number you could get back from a modulus operation. Mod 5, the biggest number you can get back from mod 5 is 4, okay? That is the idea there. So this is key. Don't forget that. And so here's what you can do. You can do addition mod m. You can do multiplication mod m. You do powers. It's just, you do math. And at the, at the end, after you do everything, you just work mod m, okay? That is useful for us. So first do your uh, operation, then do mod m. Okay, so for example, very easy example. Let's say we're working mod 5. So 4 plus 3 mod 5. That's too big to fit into mod 5, so we'll squish it back down. Right? And that's 7 mod 5, which is 2. Right? It goes back between 0 and 4 again. Okay? And then maybe we had 4 times 4 mod 5. These numbers were originally within the range, but we got we made them too big by doing multiplication. So that's 16 now, mod 5. And so that gives us back uh, 1, right? And so doing math in this way, getting these answers back that don't make a whole lot of sense, like that's 16 somehow is 1, that gives you some powerful options, uh, especially when it comes to encryption. We'll get into that later. Okay, so that's modular arithmetic. And uh, hopefully it makes sense. It's just do math and then pick a modulus and always do mod that at the end of your math. Okay? That is modular arithmetic. And so you can get extra fancy. This is a whole branch of mathematics. And so you can make mod m multiplication and addition tables, because why not? And uh, you can draw cool symbols to represent that you're working with a certain modulus. Okay? So for example, if you're doing mod m addition and multiplication, sometimes uh, you write that you're working in z subscript m, okay? Or zm for short. So this is the set of numbers that I get, z subscript m. That's all the numbers mod 5, right? So 0, or mod m, 0, 1, all the way to m minus 1. If m was 5, then this would be 0 to 4. Okay, those are all the numbers you get in your z, m, land. Okay? So here, for example, is z5, the multiplication table and the addition table. Because, for example, when you add uh, 4 to four to 2, you get back 6, but uh, mod 5, that's just 1, right? And same for multiplication. Uh, if you do 
2 times 4, that gives you 8, but mod 5 again, that's 3, right? There's 3 left over after dividing into by 5. So I think you can maybe see some patterns here. Isn't that cute? They kind of wrap around. They're very interesting. But those are the numbers that you use if you're doing mod 5 work, OK? Those are all the numbers you get, which is nice. You have now shrunk all of the integers into a finite number of integers. That's all the different kinds of math that you can do as far as addition and multiplication goes, OK? More terms. We say that x is congruent to y mod m if they are the same after taking mod. So x mod m and y mod m, those happen to be equal, OK? We say those are congruent numbers. All right, so let's talk about that. Because uh, those numbers used to be different, right? x and y are not the same normally, most likely. But once you take mod, mod 5, for example, then they somehow both became 1, or they both became 2, something like that. OK? Now they're the same. So this is uh, sometimes written as x is congruent. This is You'd read it like that, an equivalent congruent to y. And then in parentheses, we say mod m. OK? So for example, uh, 0 is equivalent to 5, mod 5 because 0 mod 5 and 5 mod 5 are both 0. Yeah. Similarly, 5 is equivalent to 10 mod 5. Take mod 5 on both of these, you get back the same answer. Any multiple of 5, right? Uh, 15 is equivalent to 55 mod 5. Congruent to 5 mod 5. And then same with like 1. 1 is congruent to 6, is congruent to 11 mod 5. Those are all the same number after taking mod 5, right? Each of these three. That's the idea. That is congruence using modular arithmetic, OK? And that's interesting. So uh, before I get to show you like cool encryption stuff that lets us make use of, OK, let's do some numbers, arithmetic, and then take mods, let me prove to you a very important theorem, OK, that's going to save us a lot of computational power. So it just so happens, when you're working mod m, you don't have to wait until the very end of your arithmetic operation to do the mod m bit. You can do it earlier, and you'll still end up getting the right answer. So let me uh, explain that to you in different words. You can make the numbers small before you perform any operations like plus or times. Let me prove that to you. Uh, so for example, like instead of doing 77 times 63 mod 5, I can do instead 77 uh, mod 5, make it small. Then multiply it instead of 63 by 63 mod 5, another small number. And then take one last mod 5 at the end. <laughs> OK? And that'll give me 1. Apparently, the answer is 1. I did this ahead of time. But that's really nice. Let me show you uh, what's going on there. So 77 times 63, some big number, 4851. I can do mod 5. And the answer is 1. But I didn't have to do that much multiplication. I could have instead done 77 mod 5 first, got 2, 63 mod 5 second, got 3. And instead of getting a big number after multiplication, I can just multiply 2 and 3 now. OK, 2 times 3, then do 6 mod 5. And the answer is still 1. Isn't that cool? So that saves me a lot of computational effort when I'm trying to do modular arithmetic. OK? So that's a, a quick uh, and dirty explanation of why it might be true. Let's actually prove it for the addition case, OK? The multiplication case is pretty symmetric, so I'll just give you one. So let's do the addition case of this. So that's a proof saying that x plus y for any y and any m, that's equal to uh, first doing the mod. x mod m plus y mod m. And then do one last mod m. OK, that's our theorem statement. Uh, in order to prove it, we need some lemmas. So here are the lemmas that we will use. We'll get this one first, and then we'll use it to prove this. And this will be what we use in our theorem. OK, so let's do that. So if you decide, uh, if you felt like it, you can use the division algorithm and try to divide a number n, which I'm calling x up here, because why not? a number n or x by m, 
Okay, so pretend that D is M, and then instead of R, you can replace that with N mod M, right? Because we're trying to divide by M. So I promise if you do all that substitution, you end up with this equation. X is equal to IM plus X mod M for some integer I, okay? You can get that out of the division algorithm. And uh, then, in order to get here, we would like to solve for X mod M. Weirdly enough, you can do it, why not? X mod M is equal to, well, let's just, what, X minus I M, right? And this is all true, let me show you that this is true, like, let's have an example. So 11 mod 5, let's pretend that X is 11 and M is our usual 5. That's really equal to 1, right? But I claim it's also equal to the original X, so the 11, minus some integer multiple of 5. And there is an answer, right? It's 2. So this always works. X mod M is equal to the original number minus some uh, integer multiple of the modulus. Isn't that interesting? That's quite weird. Um, and then based on this equation, we can get this. So therefore, there is some integer such that x mod m is equal to x plus km. Okay, because essentially we're just, we can change this minus to a plus. Okay, let's, here's the k. Let k equal uh, negative i. Then x mod m, if you just plug it all in, is equal to x plus km. Bam, I found a k, no matter what. So therefore, whenever you're taking a modulus of a number by m, then you can replace that with x plus km for some integer k. And that's gonna allow our proof to go through, believe it or not. So let me show you that. Here we go. So uh, I have x and y mod m, and I am also doing these, x mod m first and then y mod m second. So, Let's unravel our lemma for these guys. Because I'm taking the modulus, there's always integers, right? X mod m is equal to x plus km for some integer k. So, so x mod m is equal to x plus km for some k. And then same for y. y mod m is equal to y plus, not k, but like j, jm. And these are for some k and j. Nice. Uh, and then these will let us get the answer. So uh, remember what we're trying to do. We're trying to do this. So let's work with that side first. So x mod m plus y mod m. Well, expanding those now that we know what those are. x mod m plus y mod m is equal to. Oh, and sorry, then we do one more mod m. <laughs> mod m. That's equal to, well, let's replace these guys with what we have determined them to be. That is x plus km. Add that to y plus jm. And then we still have a mod m. Okay. What's this equal to? Dun dun. We have, uh, we could bring these around to each other, get the multiples of m by themselves. So this is x plus y. So we're trying to keep that by itself, right? And then that's plus all the multiples of m, so km and jm. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, which is really, a, all of those are some multiple of m, so I can replace this with k plus j times m, right? Let's do that, because that's gonna give us our answer. m times k plus j, right? And then one more mod m. And this, surprisingly, is going to give us our answer because taking mod m when adding some multiple of m, this cancels out. This whole bit right here goes to zero, okay? This whole side goes to zero, and that gives me x plus y mod m, and that's our theorem. And let me show you why that makes sense, why that cancels. nice to know how to do. So for example, let's say I'm doing like uh, this operation, 1 plus 77 times 5 mod 5, okay? 
The answer is going to be 1 because, look what happens, this is going to go to 0. Any multiple of 5 goes straight to 0, doesn't it? Because, for example, uh, let's say I was just doing 1, 1 plus 5 mod 5. 5 wraps around the clock once completely and ends up in the same spot, right, when you're doing mod 5. If you do that any multiple of times, you're just winding around the clock that many times. I hope that makes sense. And let me just prove to you in Python, at least, that that, that does what it's supposed to do. 1 times 77 times 5 mod 5. Just going to be... Uh, Oh, sorry, 1 plus 77 times 5. Excuse me. That's 1. Any multiple of 5 goes away. 8 times 5, still 1. 9 times 5. They all go away because they wrap around. Adding 5 to any number mod 5 does nothing to the number. Okay, does that make sense? It was the whole 0 is equal to 5, 1 is equal to 6 is equal to 11. Adding 5 doesn't change the number. Okay? So adding any multiple of 5 doesn't change the number as well. And so that's why I'm allowed to cancel when I'm doing this addition, and I get the side that I was looking for. Okay, and that proves it there. Isn't that cool? I hope that was fun. But you can make numbers nice and small before you work on them, and that makes it easier for us to implement modular arithmetic in a computer. Okay, we'll know that we'll still get the right answer, even if we don't do the big long multiplication first. Okay, we can do that later. And let me just check the time. I think we're we're doing all right. So let's maybe have uh, a couple of these crushed ices and then reevaluate where we are. Okay, so I want you to try these yourself and we will uh, come back and I'll show you what I was thinking for them as well. So please compute the value of the following expressions and show your reasoning. Try not to use a calculator. Okay, 33 mod 7 and negative 33 mod 7. Try that. So uh, 33 mod 7, that is, okay, we're dividing by 7, getting back an answer. Use the division algorithm. 33 is equal to some multiple of 7 plus some number, right? It ends up being, it goes in, uh, 7 goes in uh, 4 times to make 28, right? And then you got to go 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 5 more. So this is the quotient, uh, this is the remainder. The remainder is 5, right? Therefore, 33 mod 7 is equal to 5. Just unraveling all those definitions. That's the answer. And notice that every time you do the division algorithm, the remainder must be between 0 and inclusive. Uh, and 5 better be strictly smaller than the number you're taking the mod from. Okay? So... 5, it better be smaller than 7. You cannot have a remainder of 7. You also can't have a negative remainder. And that is going to trip us up here because uh, C++, if you were to print this out in C++, it would give you a negative remainder, sadly. Some programming languages unfortunately don't follow the definition of the division algorithm. They don't claim that, okay, the remainder, whatever it is, R, must be strictly smaller than the thing you're taking the mod by, okay? But in math, that has to be the case. So negative 33, we have to do this. Negative 33 is equal to something times 7 plus some remainder where that remainder is, whoop, between 0 and 7, not including 7, okay? And it's a positive number. So uh, we actually need to make a bigger negative or a smaller negative number in order to get there. So uh, it looks like what we can get to is 35, right? Because we can do negative 5 times 7, that gives negative 35. And then go two more in the opposite direction, and that gives me a number that makes this all work out. Okay, so therefore, negative 33 first mod 7, that's actually equal to 2 as far as math is concerned, okay? not let C++ ruin the day, okay? I wonder what Python does. This is Python. Negative uh, 33 mod 5. What do you give back? Okay, so it does it right. But uh, C++ will give you back a negative remainder, sadly. Okay, so that's the first one. 
Did you get that by unraveling the definitions? And then the next ones, I want you to try doing this uh, in your head if you can. Don't use a calculator. Don't don't cheat. Use Racket or Python. Because this is where our stuff shines. What is power but a bunch of multiplications? I can shrink those first before I do anything. Isn't that nice? So try to calculate this and this, these power computations, and then we'll come back and do them together. Okay? So uh, we're doing we're working mod six, and so we can take these individual numbers and do mod six on them. So instead of doing forty four multiplied a bunch of times, let's do forty four mod six multiplied a bunch of times to the twelfth power. Yeah, that ends up being uh, thirty six forty two two left over, right? Two to the twelve. Just compute that mod six. That's easier. Uh, and then I stole this from your book. I'm not this cool, but you can actually uh, do this without a calculator because what is 2 to the 12 but 2 to the 6 times 2 to the 6? Both mod 6. You can break it down to smaller powers of 2 that are easier to work with. And that ends up 2 to the 6 is 64. So it's 64 times 64, mod 6. Oh man, our theorem applies again. I can do mod 6 on both of these. That is apparently uh, 4, because you can go at 6 goes in 10 times to make 60 with 4 left over. That's 4 times 4. Mod 6. That's equal to 16 mod 6. Nice, right? And that's uh, 4. So you can do it without a calculator, believe it or not. Let's try this one. 5 to the 6 mod 7. Um, again, there's a trick to involve not having to use a calculator or to make very large numbers. Uh, you can break this down into uh, 5 squared to the third, right, mod 7, which is equal to 25 times 25 times 25, three times, right, mod 7. And that's the trick. Apparently you can do this in your head if you knew to do that first. Because what's each 25 mod 7, 7, 14, 21, got 4 left over, so it's 4 times 4 times 4, mod 7 which is equal to uh, 16 times 4 is 64 mod 7. Crazy, huh? And this goes into 7 goes to uh, 9 times, right, to make 63, and that gives 1 left over. And so the answer is apparently 1, and you can, of course, uh, use a programming language to actually check all this, but you can do it in your head, and it is all thanks to this theorem. Do you see that? That's quite nice. All right, let's do one more slide, and then that'll be it for this lecture. Okay, let's talk about primes and stuff, all right? Just some more definitions before we go. So we know what it means to be prime. Let's just spell it out, right? A number is prime if it is an integer, right? Got to be a whole number. It's greater than 1. There are no negative primes. And its only factors are 1 and that number. Nobody else can divide into that number p that we're claiming is prime, okay? If it's not prime, it's composite, right? That means uh, if you just negate all of this, uh, a positive number is composite if it has a factor, positive integer, is composite if it has a factor other than one in itself, right? It's got maybe, uh, it's even, so two divides into it, and that is uh, unfortunately shooting down its desire to be prime, okay? Can't be prime if it's even. So, unless it's two. So that is primeness. Hopefully that makes enough sense. Then we have the greatest common divisor, which you may have heard of before. That is when you have two non-zero integers, can be negative, uh, x and y. It's the largest positive number though, the GCD at least, is the largest positive integer that is a factor of both x and y. So for example, uh, you can ask for the GCD of 12 and 18. Uh, that's equal to, uh, well you just, factorize all of these, get the prime factors out of 12, that's 2 times 2 times 3, 6 times 2, and then 18, that's 2 times 3 times 3, right? Because it's 9 times 2. And you just highlight all the ones that they share. So they share a 2 times 3, and so the GCD of 12 and 18 is 6. 6 is the GCD of 12 and 18. That is the largest number that divides cleanly into both of these, right? So 6 goes in twice, 
to 12 and 3 times to 18. That's the biggest number that they share in common like that. Okay, that's the greatest common divisor. Uh, on the flip side, you can have the least common multiple of non-zero integers. That's when you find the smallest positive integer that is an integer multiple of both. Okay, so uh, that's, again, you have two numbers. Let's say we want to find the least common multiple of 6 and 8. Then you just start doing uh, multiples of them, like, okay, 6, 12, 18, 24, 8, 16, 24, and once you find one that they share, that's the least common multiple, okay? Does that make sense? 24 is the least common multiple, the LCM of 6 and 8, okay? Smallest positive integer, that is an integer multiple of both x and y, okay? So that's that, and then we say that two numbers are relatively prime if their greatest common divisor is one. So as far as those two numbers are concerned, they share no factors, okay? That's relative primeness, which is gonna be interesting and useful for us when we talk about encryption, okay? This just means that they share no factors. The biggest number that goes into both of them is one, right? They share no factors. So uh, for example, seven and 12 are relatively prime because they share no factors. Their GCD would be one. And relative primeness has nothing to do with normal primeness. Seven's prime, 12 isn't. I, don't, I could pick another number that is also not prime uh, and find one that is, uh, and it could be relatively prime to 12 still. So 12 is not itself prime. That's not a requirement. It's relative primeness, okay? So if they don't share factors, like 7, 7 and 12, we say that they are relatively primes, okay? Well, it's relatively prime to each other. So those numbers are relatively prime, and those are all the fancy definitions that I wanted to teach you. So that's where we'll stop for this lecture. We'll come back next time and talk about a very, very wonderful classic theorem that uh, I will prove to you that there are an infinite number of prime numbers. It's a very, very beautiful theorem, okay? so. Uh, look forward to that in the next lecture. I'll see you then.